Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for this moment in which you will still us. We'll come in from the distractions of the world and in our minds, we will focus now on you. This is your sanctified, set-aside time for us to honor you through the learning of your word. So bless all of those who are watching and bless those who by telephone are on and listening, those in various cities where this television broadcast will be shown. Let the Holy Ghost go into the space where they are. Breathe on me, breath of God. Forgive me of my sins and wash me in the blood and help me to say what you want me to say. And then, God, your word will not return void. Cause someone to accept you as Savior, someone to rededicate, someone to join the church. Satan is defeated and Jesus is Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I want to finish our lesson from last week. Lesson number three. This is lesson number three on the subject, a time to weep and a time to laugh. And I believe if you've been keeping up with what's been happening in the world, every day it's something good, something bad. Something is always happening. So revelation knowledge is what we're going to look for tonight as we study and look together in the Word of God we want to have study. I want you to have some study notes in front of you and get ready to write some things down. As we go into this book of Lamentations, we've been studying the book of Lamentations, and each week here's what we've done. The book of Lamentations, just a few chapters long, about five chapters, and what we've been doing is taking one chapter, either a week or in this case, in two weeks, looking at commonalities and saying some of the same things over and over again so that we can understand the relevance of the book of Lamenta Lamentations today. Now, not too many people have favorite scriptures from the book of Lamentations. Not too many. But all of God's word, even when it seems negative, never ends without giving us a way to turn, and here's, here's what we want to do, turn a negative into a positive. So each week we've looked at a chapter and then we've compared that chapter using our foundational scripture, which I'll ask you to open up to uh, tonight, which is Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We want to understand the cause of our spiritual pain. And I'll explain if you're joining for the first time. I'll take a few moments and, 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 and recap. We've been comparing it with those words in the book of Ecclesiastes to the situation of the children of Israel who are in Lamentations. In that book, it, is, it describes them being in Babylonian captivity. That's the lament. That's the eulogy. But then we close out with a song of praise by comparing a relevant book or rec a, a relative division of Psalms to everything that we've looked at in Lamentations. And that's what we want to do tonight. So if your Bibles are open to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verse 1 and verse 4. Verse number 1, you know it now. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. For every purpose that God is working out, there is a season and a time. And that's why it's always good to make sure you learn that purpose because it's only for a season, and you don't want to miss your season. Verse number four, and here's where we are. There is a time to weep, and there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. I've been saying this over and over again, that for believers, pain, weeping, is a part of life. It's something that we cannot escape, and yet we cannot get offended at God. There are seasons in each life which are very painful for every born person into this world. But the pain will not be the end of the story, especially for believers. 
And I know that while you're watching, there are some believers out there. I know there are believers out there. You're here because you're a believer or you're here because you're trying to decide whether or not you want to believe. So he says that there's always that time. But thank God there will also come a time when laughter and smiling and joy returns. And that is what this passage is all about, a time of laughter. We don't want to forget about that. And I'll dwell more on that as I go through. I always say to Christians, you don't always have to be so serious all the time. We don't always have to look like we are, you know, just uh, joyless people. But you can have a smile on your face. You can have some laughter because God intends for us to be happy. Laughter is a part of the Word of God. Psalm 2, verse 4. If you have Psalm 2, just turn there and write it down. Rather, no, you don't have it. Write down Psalm 2, verse 4. I read it from the King James Version. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And here's what he's saying. Saying even in the heavens, there's laughter. This psalm, Psalm 2, is just for the record, is a psalm of ultimate victory, a victory of Christ. It is a psalm of our victory. It is a psalm in which he asks us and he says to us in so many words, here is what I need you to do. The Word of God also tells us that while God is, is dealing with this whole understanding of laughter, that sometimes God is not laughing because something is funny. He's laughing because he's saying, no matter what man do, man cannot win against me. I'm trying to get their attention, but they cannot win against me at all. And so the Bible reminds us of that over and over again. The Bible also reminds us of a, the passage of Scripture where the Lord raises the question, why do the heathen rage? Why is it that the heathen, the, he, why is it that I'm saying there's a time for laughter, but it seems like as you look in the world, all you see is rage everywhere you look. People are angry. They are angry. Anytime a brother can just get, get angry because someone says, wear a mask. And he gets so angry until he pulls out an AK-15 rifle and begins to shoot at police officers. For one moment, he did not stop to think that he didn't want to wear a mask for, for maybe five or ten minutes. But now he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. What makes this rage come about? What makes it so that a lady is sitting in line in her car at a Burger King going up to get a sandwich and she decides that, the, you know, in her mind, the wait is long? Well, there are people in front of her. She goes in. She, they tell her they, they're doing the best they can. She goes back out. She sends her boyfriend in and he shoots the server. And sadly enough, he had only been working there for a few days. They are raging. And the Bible says not only are they raging, but they are raging because they are imagining vain things. Why is the world in the condition that it's in? What, and what shall be our response? They, they are raging. They plan and act out things that they know will come to no good end, but they do it anyway. And yet the Bible says, he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh at them. And he's laughing at them not because he thinks that what they're doing is funny, but he's laughing because he's saying, I've called you, I've asked you, you've rebuffed me, and now you keep doing things your own way. And you're wondering, why is it that you keep getting the same results? Yes, there's some laughter in heaven. The Bible also records that for believers, even when we weep, it will not lead us to nothingness. St. Luke 6, 21, I love this verse. He says, blessed are ye that hunger now, for you shall be filled. And blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you. He says, you, there will come a time 
when you'll be able to just laugh. There'll come a time when you'll have joy. There will come a time when peace like a river will prevail. And so God says, listen, there will come a time when you're going to even laugh because of your victory. You're going to say, it's Ty Trebet who says, I like this. He says, the devil thought he had me. He thought he had me. He thought my life was over. He thought by now I'd give up. He thought I'd had no more. But then that's when someone greater stepped into my situation and my morning has begun. He turned it around. And if I cannot encourage you with anything else tonight, let me tell you this. God isn't leaving us where we are. He's going to turn this situation around. He's going to turn what you are experiencing around. There is a time for us to go through tough times. It's prophetic. It is in the word. We cannot get around it, but that will not be the end of our story. And let me look at Lamentations chapter 2. Let me, let me pick up where we left off. I'm going to just say some quick things about it to remind you of what we said. We studied last week verses 1 to 10. And in studying 1 to 10, it was entitled Judgment Which Comes After Sin. And we said Lamentations is the book of, of reality. It really is. Lamentation deals with pain. It deals with spiritual death. It deals with the death of dreams and visions and hope. That's Lamentations. And I'll tell you this, not a whole lot of people will go to the book of Lamentations to find comfort. In that respect, it's just not there. I, don't, I haven't preached a lot from Lamentations. I haven't preached a lot from it. I don't know, consciously or subconsciously, just haven't. We don't tend to go to those, to those books. We like scriptures like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's great. We like scriptures like, the Lord is my light and my salvation. That's great. We love those scriptures, but we've got to remember that God's job is to get us out of this world and into the kingdom called heaven. And to do so, he's got to say some tough things sometimes, but it's only out of his tough love. We looked at those verses and, and we said that most Christians, again, don't read it because it confronts the reality of pain. And now the book of Lamentations is not a book where you go to learn how to get over your pain. It isn't a book of comfort. It's a book that confronts us. It's a book that reminds us that there's some situations we don't want to get into. So tonight, let me read verses 11 to 20, I believe, verses 11 to 20. And now it shifts to Jeremiah, who is the writer. Jeremiah, the great prophet, who is experiencing firsthand Babylonian captivity with the people who were once free. They were free to serve God. They were free to love God. And now here he is. He says, I know this happened. I'm an eyewitness. Let me tell you what I saw. He says in verse 11, mine eyes do fail with tears. And tonight I'm going to read this both in the King James and later on I'm going to read it in the New International Version. He says, my bowels are troubled. My liver is poured upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people because the children and the infants swoon into the streets of the city. Verse 12, and the infants and the children, they say to their mothers, where is corn? Where is wine? Where is food? When they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was poured out into their mother's bosom, he's talking out of anguish. He's speaking out of anguish. He says, what thing shall I take to witness for thee? What thing shall I liken to thee? O daughter of Jerusalem, O church of God, what can I like? liken this to? What shall I equal? What, sh what is equal to this that I can comfort thee? O virgin daughter of Zion, for the breach is great like the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen vain and foolish things for you, and they have not discovered your iniquity to turn away from captivity but have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. All that pass by clap their hands at you. They look at you making fun of you. They hiss and wag their head at the great, I'm going to put that in there, daughter of Jerusalem, saying this city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth, 
All your enemies have opened their mouths against you. They hiss, they gnash the teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly, this is the day that we looked for. Let me, let me stop here and say this. Satan is saying a whole lot of things about you. He thinks, he, he, he believes he's got you where he can take you out. And he's saying some of the same things about you and me. He, listen, he says, we have found, we have seen it. The Lord hath done that which had devised. He, listen, the Lord has done this. And that's what made it so hurtful to them. God turned their backs on him. He hath fulfilled his word that he has commanded in the days of old. He hath thrown out and hath not pitied, and he hath caused your enemy to re The Lord let your enemy rejoice over you. He set up the horn, and the word horn there means strength. Horn always means strength. He said he set up the strength of your act. God gave your enemy strength to take you out. Their heart cried unto the Lord. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river at night. Give thyself no, no rest. Let not the apple of your eyes cease. Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. There's hope when you call on the Lord. Lift up your hands toward him for the life of your young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Behold, O Lord. And consider to whom you've done this to. Shall the women eat their fruit and children of a span long? Shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Wow. After I read something like that, all I can do is take a deep breath. And kind of say, this is in the Bible. It's in the word of God. It's the reflections of the eyewitness. He's not talking about sinners. He's talking about God's people. He's not talking about unbelievers. He's firsthand witness who sees firsthand how they strayed from God, how they compromised, connected themselves to unbelievers. And many started doing what the unbelievers were doing. They refused to listen to the warnings of the prophets like Isaiah, and God had to bring judgment, not out of hatred, rather love for his people. And when you read firsthand what he's saying, he's saying, I've never seen anything like this. I never thought this could happen, not to God's people. Now, that was for a different reason. That was a different time, and I'll pick up on that. But before I do, let me, let me give you the premise, as you remember, it's the same from last week, and I ask you to look at the premise and look at the two points from whence I did not speak and, and, and for you to maybe read the rest of Lamentations and look at that. I hope some of you did. Uh, the, the premise was very simple. In times of pain, merely managing it is not the answer. You know, you take a pill that just manages, it just takes the, the pain away, but it does nothing to the symptoms. It just says pain reliever. The premise says we must seek the cause. And we got to respond to spiritual matters with God's remedy. Get it again. In times of pain, merely managing it is not the answer. We must seek the cause and we must respond with God's remedy. Three takeaways. I spent a lot of time on point one last week because I intended to do that. I intended for it to be two sermons and to spend time here because this was a major point of it. Spiritual pain is a warning that something deeper may be wrong. You ever get up and you have that feeling something is wrong, but you can't put your finger on it? You ever get up and say, I just feel like something is wrong, but I don't know what it is. I feel like something is going to happen. And maybe that's something in your spirit telling you that this is the time to just stop everything and pray. You know, the spirit discerns and the spirit is able to let you know when the devil is coming against you to attack you and have you stop and call on the angels of the Lord and call on the name of Jesus who said, I will disperse angels to come and see about you. There are times when we just know something is wrong, but it's a warning. The second thing I want to tell you is that when you get into this situation when you and I, now hear me out because I'll make it very plain, that I'm not saying that all of this is happening because the church is under some kind of judgment. I do believe there are some people who the purpose that God wants to work 
out of this for some Christians is that he wants them to come back to him. I didn't say that's the reason. I'll talk about that in a moment. There's a difference between the purpose and the reason. And so when you get like that and you get to the place where you know, wait a minute, nothing's working for me. Nothing's helping me. You can't turn to the world because number two says worldly placebos, sugar pills we used to call them, that doctors use when they don't really want to tell you that nothing's wrong and you insist something is wrong and it's in your mind and they give you something anyway. Worldly placebos cannot produce pseudo, meaning false, pseudo temporary release. It can, uh, let me say it again, those placebos can produce pseudo temporary relief, but here's the problem. It cannot cure the cause. Let that sink in for a moment. Let's go to number three, and I'll close with this one later on. Here's the thing about spiritual pain. It can be self-inflicted, but oh, God can use it to get our attention. I'll talk about that for a moment. Spiritual pain can be self-inflicted. Sometimes we say, oh, the devil's after me. The devil's doing this. And God's saying, the devil didn't do it. You're doing it. You're doing it. But God can use it to get our attention. To, and, it, and here's what he wants to do. He's not trying to punish us. He's not trying to hurt us. He's not trying to condemn us. He's trying to show us that we are loved, thus allowing us to experience the grace of God. It is the grace of God that we experience even through all of this. The pain of Judas, you remember Judas? The pain that he had was self-inflicted. Judas decided that he was going to betray the Lord. And as a result of that, the pain that he had was so deep until he went out and committed suicide. Self-inflicted. Jeremiah gives firsthand eyewitness experience. Jeremiah was there. He, a prophet, was there in captivity, not because he uh, disobeyed God. Rather, he was a victim of the consequences of the sins of others. The victim of the consequences of the sins of others. He was a part of the nation. When God raised up, the nation to come in and overpower them, whoever was in the nation, right, wrong, good, or bad. And there are some things that we all experience in life. You know, the other day, the other day, um, all my lights went out and the whole neighborhood went out and I was trying to write a sermon. I was praying. I said, God, can you turn my lights on? <laughs> he reminded me everybody's lights are off. I, I just can't turn your lights on. You know, you just say stuff when, you know, you're like, like God, not now. Can you just turn, just turn my lights on because I'm writing a sermon. He couldn't do that. I was a victim of what was happening to the whole neighborhood because I was in the neighborhood. And we are in a world that's full of sin and pain and anguish and brokenness. And sometimes there's nothing we can do about it. And so, I, so Jeremiah says, I'm in pain. I'm a recipient of this. He says, I, I, I'm seeing this. And there were other good people who loved God, who had not forsaken God. And they, too, were in Babylonian captivity. There was a remnant outside and inside. The remnant means those who were left, those who were still left serving God. But I want to thank God that even though they had to go through it, thank God that even in a world that was destroyed for them, even though the remnant did not deserve to be there, thank God they were praying people like Jeremiah who was there to still call on God. And sometime when you don't understand what's happening in your life and why you're in a situation. Maybe it's because God says, you told me I could use you. You said you were my child. You told me I could fill you with my spirit. I don't need you always in the church shouting with my spirit. Sometimes I need you where the people are hurting. Sometimes I need you where the pain is. And sometimes you've got to experience that pain so that you can pray in power. Let me just read it again so you get this understanding from Lamentations 2, again, 11 to 14. He said, my eyes fail from weeping. I am in torment within my heart is poured out on the ground. 
because my people are destroyed. Because children and infants faint. I'm reading it again because I want you to get in your spirit. It's the condition of the church of that day. They faint in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is the bread? Where's the wine? We want something to eat. And yet even the children faint like the wounded in the streets of the city as their lives ebb away in their mother's arms. What can I say for you? What can I compare you, daughter of Jerusalem, to what can I liken you that I may comfort you? Virgin daughter, Zion, God's people, Israel, your wound is as deep in, as the sea. Who can heal you? The visions of your prophets were false and worthless. They did not expose your sin to ward off your captivity. The prophecies they gave you were false and they were misleading. Wow. Can you hear Jeremiah's pain? Even though he loved God, he was experiencing the same pain. He says, I'm in emo I am in emotional and physical distress when I see how God's people are suffering. He says in the, in, 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 in the, old, in the uh, King James, my liver hurting. And liver here meant heart. Liver was also used as the seed of emotion. He says, my heart is broken at, at what I see. And so here's a question I want to ask you. What do you spiritually really see in this pandemic? We can't be like the rest of the world. We just can't see it as some virus. We just can't see it as everything is being disrupted. We cannot go around like everybody else and just see this. We who are children of God, we've got to understand that in spite of what's happening, God is still on the throne and spiritually we've got to still turn our face to him. Yes, we will be dismayed at times. Yes, we will be down and out at times. But there comes a time when you've got to ask yourself, God is trying to tell somebody something. What is he saying? And is he trying to say it to me? What is God trying to say? Do you see anything that the church as a whole or we as individuals can learn from it? Or do you hear any message from God? He says your prophets who you love to listen to, they lied to you. They refuse to deal with your sin. All they wanted to do was preach what you wanted to hear. Here's what he's saying. And this may not refer to you, but I want you to get the text and, get, and understand the context of who he was speaking to and why. He said, I'm Jeremiah, and I spoke to you and told you what God says. But you laughed at me, and you only wanted messages that were positive and that will leave you, that will help you to leave church feeling good and feeling joyful because you didn't like anyone telling you that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. You wanted a placebo, but when the word of God comes, it cuts us sometimes. It cuts us. It's a two-edged sword. It cuts going in and it cuts going out, but thank God if the word cuts me, that lets me know that God must love me. God is trying to change some things about my life. He said, all you want to hear are messages to tell you how great you are and how prosperous you can be and how rich you can be. But he says, no, you laughed at it and you went after the false prophets who refused. I didn't write this. I'm preaching it. They refused to tell you about your sin. They refused to tell you get right with God, but you followed them. And now God is trying to get his word to you and to get it to you. He had to cut you off from the church, cut you off from everybody, and lock you in so that finally you can hear a word from the Lord. Wow. 15 to 16, verses 15 to 16, all who pass your way clap their hands at you. They scoff and shake their heads at daughters of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All your enemies open their mouths wide against you. They scoff and gnash their teeth. Listen to me for just a moment. I want to tell you this. I want you to take this point home with you. And when I say home, I mean in your hearts and your mind, and also because I'm used to saying that. <laughs> I want you to take this with you. No matter the source, no matter the reason, for any pain we have, God is still the healer. 
Oh, man, listen, you want to talk about the cause of, of our spiritual pain, the cause of our feeling empty and feeling useless and sometimes feeling isolated and sometimes we're just angry and we don't really know how to take that anger out and what to do. But there is one called Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer and we all need healing of some sort. As a matter of fact, write this down or turn your devices or Bible to uh, Jeremiah 8, 22. Just turn it there for a moment, Jeremiah 8, 22. And the reason I wanted to go there again, we've gone there, I've visited this in another lesson in which I taught, but in Jeremiah 8, 22, Jeremiah asked the question, you remember this, is there no balm in Gilead? We laugh sometimes. God, one of our members, they, 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 come and they talk sometimes, and one of our members came and said, you know what? All these years, I thought they were saying is they are bomb <laughs> in Gilead. I, I didn't really know. I'm not going to call any names out. Is there no balm, B-A-L-M, in Gilead? Balm simply means something made into an ointment. Jeremiah says, I'm hurting with you. I don't want to see you like this. Sometimes God wants us to stop just being concerned about ourselves and feel the pain of other people. Have a burden for other people. We are all worried about sometimes ourselves and ourselves and ourselves. But God says, no, it's not always about your pain. I want to turn Jeremiah's question into a positive statement. That's what I've come to tell you today. God is about to turn this negative situation that you and I are experiencing into a positive for you. He will not leave us like this. He says, is there no balm that is a resin or an ointment? that comes from a tree that grows in a region of Gilead that produces an ointment that one can put on their sores and put on their, 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 their hurts and pains. He said, is there no balm in Gilead? And later on, a hymn writer picked it up and took the song and took the question and turned it into a positive statement. Jeremiah says, is there a balm? He's there in captivity. He's saying, God, why has this pandemic hurt and shut all of us down? But then he turned around and says, there is a bomb in Gilead. There's a bomb in Gilead. Not is there, but there is a bomb in Gilead to heal a sin sick soul. He says, the writer says, sometimes I get discouraged and I think my work is in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my, my soul again. I've come to tell somebody there's still a God with healing in his wings. There's still a God who sees your wounds, who sees your tears, who sees our confusion. But he will not leave us and he will not forsake us. God wants to turn your limitations into his possibility. Remember, takeaway number two, number two, worldly placebos can produce pseudo temporary relief, but cannot cure the cause. Oh man, this is what I've come to tell you tonight. God wants to turn your lamentations, that eulogy about our situation. That eulogy that people, everybody's saying, well, the church isn't doing this and the church isn't that. Let me tell you something. The church is getting itself together. No, we've done, we've done a lot of things that were right. And there's some things we got to try and tweak and get it together. But one day Jesus is coming. And the reason I know the church isn't going to fail is because Jesus is not coming back for a broken church. He's not coming back for a church that is disobedient. There's, got, there's a revival that's going to break out before he returns. He says, when I come back, I'm coming back for a glorious church without spot and without blemish, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Maybe it's not about us, but it includes us. And this is a time for us to ask God, is there any word from you about me, about us. What could that word be? Oh, listen, Reverend, I always quote him, Reverend Tony Evans, a great pastor from Dallas, Texas, and my homeboy from Baltimore. He put it like this. Listen to me. I don't care who you are. He says, sometimes God will let you hit rock bottom so that you can discover that he is the rock at the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This rock is Jesus. He's the one. And, and I don't care where you land. When you love God, it doesn't matter where you land. Know this, in the name of Jesus, you're going to land 
out of this in a safe place. You'll have some scars along the way. We've lost some loved ones along the way. We're hurting. We're crying. Oh, we got to hit rock bottom, but don't worry about hitting rock bottom. The rock of ages, the rock who is Jesus, the solid rock. He says he is the rock. So I've come to tell you in the name of Jesus this point. Today, today, I accept God's remedy to bring healing to me. Now, preach, I don't think I've done anything to deserve this pandemic. I didn't ask you that. That's not what this is about. This is not about condemnation and judgment. It's about taking a period to just say, out of humility, search me, Lord. Everybody says, oh, the church is going to get itself together. But no, the church cannot get itself together until individuals get themselves together. One, the church will become powerful. One member at a time, one by one, we'll come together. He says sometimes you got to hit rock bottom. How many of you know that sometimes when you hit rock bottom, that's what led you to Jesus? How many of you know sometimes when you hit rock bottom, that's when you pray more? That's a good thing that comes out of it because I refuse to let the devil tell me anything related to the love of God for my life. He says in Lamentations 2.14, you listen to quack doctors. You listen to fake friends. You took the ungodly advice of your friends who told you false information about your salvation. They refused to tell you about sin because they did not want you to be healed. They led you away from church. They told you every Sunday morning, you don't need to go to church. Your God is not in the church. And instead of you standing on the foundation of God, you listened to them. And you, we, we went every other place and spent all their money following after somebody instead of realizing that the Jesus Christ is a greatest friend that we have. And all he asks us to do is honor him by giving him a portion of our time. Give him our lives. Give him our strength. He said, you took a placebo. Listen to me. Preachers, cry loud. Tell people God loves them. I'm speaking to some pastor tonight, and you're watching me right now. And I'm here to tell you that we can't just preach part of the word. We've got to preach the whole word. I want to encourage you to know that God is calling for those who are willing to stand up and cry loud and spare not. When you are in pain, you got to know that your mem mem many members are in pain. And when they are in pain, they are vulnerable and they need medicine, spiritual medicine. And they, you can't just go to anybody. You, you can't try to cover up your pain with placebos. Partying won't take it away. No, God, however, thank God, whenever we go through pain, whether it's our fault, somebody else's fault, or whether it's just something we're caught up in, here's the good news. God never allows pain without a purpose. It's like he says, now that you're in it, let me help you out of it. Now that you got to go through it, oh, spiritual pain, spiritual pain that comes from hidden areas of your life, x-rays can't see it. There's no scale to determine how immense it is. Just struggling with the meaning of life. And where is God for me right now? It's painful. But thank God when you go through some painful things, I'll show you as I close with the psalm in a moment. When you go through some, some, some painful things, I want you to know that the painful it is, the greater the joy. The harder the problem that you're going through, the lighter and the blessed God will lift you up. Spiritual pain. What do you mean spiritual pain, preacher? Spiritual pain can come from an inability to forgive yourself. It can come from a spiritual condition, inability to forgive others. It can come from disappointment in God and his lack of an adequate response. Spiritual pain, feelings of emptiness, bad and broken relationships. So we turn to toxic people, the placebo. We long for things and money and materialism. That's a placebo. Some takes drugs, sexual pursuits, and parties, all placebos. But the cause lamentations reveal is the lack of the presence of the one who healeth all of our diseases. You can't say, I'm not going to the doctor 
because I could heal. I don't need a doctor. Oh, we do. We do. Remember the third takeaway? The third takeaway? Spiritual pain can be self-inflicted, but God can use it to get our attention. Oh, glory to God. God can use it to get our attention. And that's what I've come to tell you tonight in the name of Jesus. I, I want to accept God's remedy. God, I don't know how you're going to bring us out of this thing. I don't know how our nation is going to turn out. But I know you need some people to fast and pray. And you need some people who will not just see this as some worldly pandemic caused by this or that. No, God, now that I'm here, I just want to know that I will not always remain in the same captivity that everyone else is in and if I've got to suffer in order to be the one who will stand on the wall maybe my job in this is to pray for my family like never before I'm not going to keep asking and saying woe is me and why me no I'm going to stand up and say wait a minute I know who I am I know whose I am and this little light of mine I'm going to let it shine shine right here what can be my purpose what can be the cause the cause may be that God says I put something in you and until you start to manifest me I cannot manifest for you but if you decide that my Christian walk is to be a light shining in darkness a voice in the wilderness it is to be hope in time it is to be medicine through the word of God I'm not just going to sit here and die I'm not going to sit here and worry myself to death I've got something that God has given me use it Use it. Use it. Listen to me. He says he puts it like this. Ah, listen, here's, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to close with this. Here it is. In the name of Jesus, I will not give up until I turn my pain into power. I'm not sitting here waiting to get for CNN and MSNBC to tell me when things are changing. Ah, no, 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 no. I'm going to be like Jeremiah in the midst of it all. I'm going to cry out to God. As a matter of fact, verses 20 to 22, the last ones that I want to use for tonight, and then I'm going, and I'm going with this. I want you to know that, yes, we may have some more pain ahead. I can't lie. You might have some more pain ahead, but I need you to know that there's purpose in it. And I want you to know that we're not going through this by ourselves. Maybe that's why Jeremiah and there were a few who were in captivity, who had not forsaken God. They were caught up with the net that, the, so to speak, that the king put out and said, bring her all into captivity. But there were some praying children there. And I need you to know that in the name of Jesus, I want us to rise up and take our position and to say, listen to me, though you slay me, yet will I trust him. Where are the Jeremiahs in this pandemic? Where are are those who are saying, wait a minute, I know in whom I believe. He shall stand at the latter day after the skin worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Verses 20 to 22 reminds us there's hope in the pandemic. There's hope even in this situation, even in this lamentation season of our lives. It seems like there is no life nowhere. It seems like death is everywhere. It seems like we never have experienced anything like this, ups and downs, and can't find any meaning to this. Last, the Laugh one minute, depressed the next minute, full of hope one minute, and down the next minute. We are not schizophrenic. This is how we're supposed to feel. We are Christians, but we are in a human body. You're supposed to go through the emotions. And don't let somebody come and tell you when you're down and out. And they're saying, well, you know, you're supposed to trust God. You know, you're supposed to do this. You've been through this. You tell them, wait a minute. You may be in my position tomorrow. Right now, I just need a Jeremiah to pray for me. I need a Jeremiah who will come with the bomb in Gilead and say, look, you are my brother. You help me. I'm going to help you. Verse 20 ends the this thing in sorrow about sorrow he says there's still something good about this here it is I'm going to turn your laughter into joy here comes the joy that I see about this uh, passage I've read to you tonight he, he gives these words in verse number 20 hallelujah there is there shall be an understanding between God and I that when I turn to God here's what it, he, they said he says Lord behold me Lord, I, here's the help. Lord, wait a minute. I know it. I need you to see me. I need your attention now. I need some help now. 
And I've come to tell someone who will receive this, rejoice, you have God's attention. You may not seem like it because it looks like your prayers are not being answered. Your cupboard, your refrigerator, your pockets, your salary, your money is getting lower and lower. But I need you to know that God needs you to know before you even call on him. Hallelujah. You have someone that you can call on. Here's what he says in 2 Timothy, because listen to me, God is suffering with us. He's enduring with us. He's going through it with us. And 2 Timothy, and if he's going through it with us, 2 Timothy 2, 12 says, if we suffer or if we endure with him, we shall also reign with him. If I endure, if I go through it, listen, if you and I have to go through this pandemic or any other pain in our lives, you've had rejection in your past, you've had broken hearts, you've had broken spirits, we all have, we've had broken dreams, but I'm going through this with the Lord. I'm not going through it by myself. Where is the Lord? He's in my temple. He is in me. Hallelujah. He's in me. Luke reminds us. Luke reminds us of something that's very important. And I want to bring this to your attention today. And I want you to leave here knowing God has you. What is the cause of the spiritual pain? Sometimes it's neglect of what you have in you and you won't reach for it. Stop reaching for things and people and huh? stop and look inside. Jesus raised this, Jesus said this to some scribes and Pharisees in a way he wanted to say it. And I've come to say it to you. <laughs> he said, physician, heal yourself. You ever notice that sometimes doctors spend time healing everybody else but neglect themselves? I know you another example, you'll get this. You ever see a hairstylist that can do, I mean, can do hair? I mean, really, I mean, nobody can do hair. But their hair is always jacked up. <laughs> You'll get that in a moment. It's not that they don't know how. It's self-neglect. And so Jesus says in a rather sarcastic way to them, but I say it truly to you because that's the other side of this. He says, physician, the balm and Gilead is in you. Heal yourself. He said unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in uh, Capernaum, do also here in this country. Jesus was saying, I know you're not going to do it, but you can. I'm here to tell somebody else. The healing is in you. Yes, it is. The hope is in you. When he saved you, he made you a person with access to every pharmaceutical thing spiritually that you will ever need. It's inside of you. Hope is inside of you. Power is inside of you. Grace is inside of you. Peace is inside of you. The Holy Ghost is inside of you. The anointing is inside of you. And so instead of looking around for things to change right where you are, I want to challenge you. Physician, heal yourself. He said, no, you don't have to go anywhere. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. I want to send you home with this song of joy. I want to send you back where, you know, to your living room or down and wherever you are. I want to send you back with this Psalm 26. Thank God. I want to tell you that God has a way to turn your pain in to promise. He has a way of bringing you out of this with a song. I'm coming out of this with a song. I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let anybody else write a eulogy for me. I'm not going to let anybody else tell me you're going down. You know, they say I'm falling and I can't get up. Yes, I can get up. As a matter of fact, he will pick you up. He will turn you around. Place your feet on solid ground. Physician, go to your closet and reach inside of you and don't be like the world. They don't know what to do, but we know what to do. Psalm 126 is a psalm, a psalm of release, a psalm of when they finally made it. They were in captivity for 70 years, and finally they hear these words, and they don't know how to respond to it. Psalm 126, he says, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, 
we were like them that dream. Hey, by the way, did I tell you that God turned, God, he turned it? He turned it. <laughs> he, he turned it. He says, one, I put you in, but now I'm bringing you out. When they got word that your captivity is over and you're able to go back home, he said, we thought it was like a dream. You don't miss something until you don't have it. He says, then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. A day of rejoicing is coming. Yeah, you can rejoice now. I want you to rejoice now. But a greater day is coming because when God brings us out of this better and stronger and more committed and in our faith and knowing who God is, when he brings us out, he, they used to sing a song. They used to, they used to ask it like this. How did you feel? When you come out of the wilderness, I felt like shouting. I felt like running. I felt like rejoicing. The day is coming when our tears will be turned into laughter. He says in Psalm 126, he said, our mouth was filled with laughter. Then they said among the heathen, the Lord had done great things for them. In other words, they came out with a testimony. They came out saying, look what God has brought us through. We lost many in there, but God still brought us through. He still preserved us, they say. The Lord has done. He says, turn again our captivity, O Lord. Turn our captivity. Look at verse 4 of Psalm 126. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams of the south. I love that because I understand it. He says, take, you've taken our captivity and you've turned it around like the streams of the south. They were talking about a river in, in southern Palestine called uh, the Negev River. And the Negev, Negev River was like, it was a river that 11 months it was dry, no water. But when the water season came, at the end of 11 months, for one month, the season of rain came, and those streams that were empty begin to not just overflow, but they begin viv forcefully and, and ferociously to roar. And he says the water has returned and the people needed water in that region. And they tried to collect as much as they could for the dry season and they ran out. But one month the water came and they were so overjoyed to see the river. And so he says in this verse, that's how we felt when God brought us out like a newborn baby. I've been redeemed. Hold on to God. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. He he says, this is what I've come to tell you tonight. I've come to tell you. He says, they that sow, verse 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Did you get that? He says, so if you notice, the Bible uses more metaphors about farmers who went to sow a seed, he uses that example more than any other example. And so he says to us, it's all right to cry. We used to sing the song, Trouble in My Way. I got to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right. Jesus will fix it after a while. Yes, you've got to cry. Yes, I'm crying over loved ones. Yes, I'm concerned over family. But God will bring us through. And he said, the more you cry, don't just see yourself as pitiful, going through a pitiful situation. Lift up your head. Cheer yourself up. Get up and understand that even your tears are coming back to you in laughter. What I've sold, hallelujah, in tears, I shall reap in laughter. And you, you got to know, y'all know what I'm getting ready to say now. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Don't you write my lamentations yet. Don't you write my lament yet. It ain't, oh, it's not over yet. Thanks be to God, a song of praise, a psalms of praise. Whatever God wants us to do, don't just address this naturally. Don't just see it. Financial trouble. Kids can't go to school. God wants you to see why he filled you with the Holy Spirit, why he brought you through so much have you ever said to yourself, I, I don't like when people say this to me. No, you can take it your way. Oh, God won't put any more on you than you can bear. Spiritually, I understand that. But in the flesh, and because we are flesh and spirit, yes, it is possible to feel that God has put more on you than you can bear. But in the name of Jesus, you know how I know you can bear it? 
Because the last time you said, I can't get through this, you made it. God won't put, and you said, God, don't, don't tell me that he has put more on me than I can bear. But you kept getting up every morning. You kept living. You kept praying. And God brought you through. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. Things may get tougher. But our God is the toughest. Lamentations. Here's my condition. But the opposite of captivity is freedom. And he whom the Son makes free. Thank you for joining me for this lesson. I hope you thought it was worth your time to sit and to hear this word and to learn. I, I preach Lamentations because I believe that every Christian should know something about every book in the Bible, no matter how small it is, no matter what it is, no matter what it's about. We've got to know it and then ask ourselves, how does this apply to me? Only you can tell. Only you can answer that. While we're going through this, it's because you've been so faithful to God and God wants you to utilize your faith for others? Is it because you haven't done the things that you should have done when times were better and God had to slow you down and shut you in to get your attention for you to know that your help does not come from your job, your car, your house, your friends, your party, the stores, Amazon, None of your help comes from none of that. Your help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Maybe he's telling you that. Maybe he's not. But if he is, but I think he's telling all of us in order for me to do what I want to do, I need the church to come together and be the church. And when this is over, there will be some Christians who will be on fire and they'll run back to the church. Unfortunately, there'll be some Christians like they are now. Some have not been in church or on a church service since church closed in March. And they're going to be lost along the wayside. Our job is to pray and encourage and to not just look at our situation in this. But God, what can you use me to do? Here am I, Isaiah. Help me. What should I do? You focus on that. God will bring you out.